Hello everyone, so today we're going to continue talking about art and specifically getting into 20th century European art. Let's dive right into it. So one branch of art that really came out big time after World War II was German Expressionism. Uh, and this is basically focusing on the suffering and shattered lives caused by the war. Uh, George Gross, who I think has a great quote here, says, Of course there was a kind of mass enthusiasm at the start. And then after a few years of when everything bogged down, when we were defeated, when everything went to pieces, all that remained at least of me and most of my friends were disgust and horror. And really it's, it's you know, war, we kind of see this after World War I with a, another movement that I'll discuss. This was something that, that really tried to, to show, you know, what the folks were dealing with. Uh, here's a great example from George Gross. As you can see there, you look at all the skeletons at Hitler's feet. And here's another uh, guy here, Otto Dix, assault troop advance under gas. Um, another really just poignant picture of explaining the feelings and the horrors of what people were dealing with, particularly within Germany. Now, another big movement at this time was the was Dadaism or the Dada movement. Uh, this was actually absolutely impacted by the war, particularly World War One. And really, it attempts to kind of get into the purposelessness, purposelessness of life. Um, there's a lot of contempt for like Western traditions. Uh, it looks at like the insanity of war. And they really wanted to almost kind of create anti-art. Um, a quote here is, Dada is the international expression of our times, the great rebellion of artistic movements. Um, and really this concept of anti-art, that they're not going to follow any of the traditional rules. We're going to do things differently, and we're going to depict some of the, the horrors and, and the, the shock, I think, that people were in, particularly after World War I. And the devastation that that had on people's you know, minds and societies, uh, and, and really expressed through a variety of different art. Um, probably your, one of your biggest, if not the biggest one, is Hannah Hoke. Um, on the left is Cut with the Kitchen Knife. And on the right is Pandora. The one on the left, you know, uh, one of the big things about Dada is um, kind of the use of different types of media and collages and stuff like that. And that you really analyze and go through everything, um, you know, evoking your emotions and whatnot. Here's another uh, main guy, uh, Tristan Zara, uh, La Melancholie de Tristan Zara. Uh, this one's looking at his dreams and things that he was exposed of and what he was thinking about. And again, you see lots of, of different things going on in this particular work. And then you have Jean Arp, uh, sometimes also went by Hans Arp. Uh, he was a sculptor. And as you can see here, kind of very interpretive, a lot of different ways that you can go with this. So really, really strong movement overall. Then we move into surrealism. And, and this, of course, was really interesting. I mean, the idea here is seeking a reality beyond the material, beyond what we can see and touch and feel, um, examining the concept of the world of the unconscious, really looking to portray fantasy or dreams or even nightmares. And the whole idea is we use logic to portray the illogical, and I mean, you don't get any bigger than Salvador Dali. Of course, The Persistence of Memory is one of his most famous paintings. Um, you can look throughout the painting, just so many different things going on at any given moment, um, open to quite a bit of interpretation. And I think a lot of times with surrealism, that was the point. And then we move into abstract expressionism, often referred to as modern art. And, and a great way I've heard this described is like action painting, that it's like energetic and spontaneous and that you kind of use emotion to guide the painting. And we don't want to adhere to like a specific form at all. And even though this is a European, you know, art video, um, I mean, the Titan here is Jackson Pollock and this is his painting Convergence. Um, Pollock basically used a lot of swirling forms and seemingly chaotic structures, and it, it really didn't have a, a specific focus, if you will. Uh, he actually paints with his canvas on the floor, which just allowed him that better uh, expression. 
Uh, a lot of people look at this, oh, it's not really art, this or that. I would, I would disagree on that because, you know, to, to allow your emotions to create these things is, is for me really, really impressive. We also have pop art, which is the idea of, you know, taking things and images of popular culture and you transform them into works of fine art. Really here, anything is possible. Uh, this is Tomorrow was an exhibit in 1956 in Whitechapel Gallery in London, which really kind of exploded pop art. And I think it's something that you really see today, you know, taking these everyday things and, and just being really creative with them. Uh, of course, the Titan here is Andy Warhol. And here on, on here, there we go, Ooh, there's a delay there. Uh, we have his famous picture of, of uh, Campbell's Soup and then uh, the pictures of Marilyn Monroe. And he would also do things of like Mao Zedong or Audrey Hepburn. Um, you can see a lot of different things, but we're taking kind of these popular or iconic ideas and pictures and, and items and putting them in this artistic motif that, again, is huge, hugely popular and, and, and I would contend still really, really popular today. Then when all of that craziness is going on, you bring something in here known as postmodernism. Um, this is kind of moving away from futurism and, and all this kind of craziness. And it, it's really big on kind of tradition. It's using things like early styles of painting or taking traditional things like weaving poetry, glasswork or metalwork and, and, and trying to take things to new heights. Um, also, they, they in, invent, if you will, like new forms, like just massive art almost enclosures or installations that are like too big for museums or need to be put outside. Um, they also do things called happenings in which they just kind of pop up events that weren't really planned and, and they're in these outdoor spaces or in random spaces that you can go see them. Um, and, and really just trying to push the boundaries a little bit here of what we were seeing. And, and here's probably one of the more famous example was the uh, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. Okay, that's a that's a really, really big one there. I believe this is in the Great Salt Lake uh, in Utah. And then Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia. This is actually in downtown New Orleans, which is like an outdoor plaza. So you, you, you can like walk up to it and sit and it combines like Roman columns with stainless steel and neon lights and stuff like that. Um, really, really interesting to, to see. And again, this work of art that you can like be in, which is really unique. Now, we also had architecture, and we've talked about architecture a variety of times, so really a big prevailing thing that we're going to get into here is something known as functionalism. And the idea here is that buildings should be, in many ways, almost like machines, that they're functional, useful, and they fulfill the purpose for which they were constructed. Um, and it's really big about art and engineering, but not unnecessary ornamentation, okay? So, like, everything needs to have a has to have a function, all right? So if it's going to be in the building or on the building, it has to have a role. We're not putting things there just to be pretty. Uh, the Americans were really out in front of this again, although we have the Europeans as well. Uh, the Chicago School under Louis H. Sullivan um, is really going to be kind of the, the, the lead on this, and they'll use things like reinforced concrete, steel frames, electric elevators, and we're going to try to build like skyscrapers and things like that with no external ornamentation. Uh, but the guy that everybody knows for this the most is Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who built lots and lots of particularly houses for wealthy patrons, uh, really big on geometric structures with long lines, overhanging roofs and planes, using lots of brick and stone. And in the interior, you'd have wide open spaces, big cathedral ceilings, built-in furniture and lighting, Again, everything really functional. But the idea of that functional can still be beautiful. A lot of people think it's a functional, it's kind of boring and just a box. And I get that. But in, in this case, that's that's not really what it's all about. And, and in no way can we see that more in Frank Lloyd Wright's building uh, Falling Water, as you can see here. Okay, so all of these things have functions. We have these geometric lines, but built right over this little waterfall here. Absolutely beautiful. And then, of course, you look at the inside. So look, we have these built-in bookcases, nice and open, looking to the outside. I mean, like, this is what it was all about. 
And over in Europe, it was the, uh, the Bauhaus school that was also in the forefront of this, uh, found by uh, Walter Gropius. Uh, and it was founded in 1919, and, and the whole staff here, it's like architects and artists and designers who their goal is to actually like blend the study of fine arts, things like painting and sculpture, with applied arts, things like printing, weaving, and furniture making. And when we get to that, we see things like the Bauhaus building, and, and, and again, very functional, very structural, but still you look at the different lines and, and artistic as well. So, you know, we, we have traveled this journey all the way from Renaissance art to today, and hopefully maybe I exposed you some things that you might find interesting or new or different, and I uh, just hope you enjoy it, okay, guys? So I will see you soon.